Hello everyone, today we talk about late Roman battle formations, theoretically listing all the various formation shapes were out there, uh, mentioning just maybe the sources, the, the terms and so on, but at the same time trying to to first of all introduce a topic we never discussed, um, if not maybe here and there in the late Roman army videos and also and that that is the point, more generally linking it to other uh, previous and uh, and later times, as there is a bit too much workamism involved in thinking, you know, what what is what what is the formation these guys use in this period? You know, there must be some specifics uh, in it that make it so different from before or after. Some genius came up with a new formula, you know, that changed all the game. You know, and these tactics were special and uh, secret and just you know, no, right? No, none of that, uh, really, and. Here we should make one of those powerful um, digressions that I will spare you for this time, and maybe we'll address soon. Uh, we start just addressing the various types of formations and explaining more or less what their actual use more than function meant, because we, we don't really know much about that. Remember that about the ancient world. First of all, of course, we are. Uh, thankful to the fact that uh, you know in the West and specifically because of the levels of documentation uh, we've had something like the Roman Empire in the production of sources that it left us and um, not just about the, 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 the you know the same empire but about lots of other peoples and how the Romans fought with them um, that uh, naturally allows to just speculate but at the same time, realizing that what we know in satisfactory terms relative to how these armies actually fought on the field, right, the actual maneuvers they performed, the actual tactics they performed, we know almost nothing, right? Even things as apparently banal, like you know how much space was there between, you know how, um, you know how close or open the order was in battle on heavy infantry or you know how were various units space we we do not know right that there are just you know relatively to the order we have just caesar and vegetius for the whole roman uh, history right there are hints here and there but no actual proofs and this is normal for anybody who has a bit of you know has acquainted decently but with ancient or just medieval sources, yet in our modern times we, we are somewhat obsessed with the idea we can't understand it, right? That, you know, that hypothesis, right? It's, you know, that man got it right in, you know, all these um, uh, idea of, I think that it was like that. Doesn't work, right? I, I even hear other powerful digression why, methodologically speaking, it does make a great difference that there is no actual evidence of how these things worked and why this in some in some way de-evaluates the importance of hypothesis um, it's because we uh, it's because of pregressed mistakes that we mm, in, introduce ourselves when dealing with these topics these are actually questions that I get all the time when on Schwerpunkt I must say I get and I want to thank you for this a lot of appreciation generally speaking, that every once in a while, uh, yeah, someone disagrees, but mostly they are broader, either because, you know, they, they, uh, they disagree on broader ideological questions. But, and it is also true that I, uh, I haven't spoken specifically too much about these tactics and their mechanics, exactly in part because of what we just said, we do not know. But somewhat I'm struck that the only questions that I get at a technical level about a, a broad variety of issues that objectively we talk a lot about tactics right and there are definitely times for which we know a lot more and there is this this first dynamic that is quite fascinating that is first of all we we know literally uh you know tens and tens if not more of times more about i don't know medieval armies especially from a certain period onwards and the the attention that we get instead towards the ancient world and either I don't know the Romans specifically or even the, Ma the Macedonians etc. It's it's so almost compulsive from a side of popular culture. I don't know why it is this. It's because of specific video games, some other um, you know cultural reason out there that uh, that it, we could even reconstruct. But specifically, there is this um, almost um, you know spasmodic need to just focus on these times. And the second one is that the only 
questions I properly get from about the theory of the art of war practically are um, mostly about tactics in in the form of you know specific formations. That is, most people that just uh, I say it because recently you know the other day when was it you know I received a question now I don't I don't open it maybe. You know, if if the guy follows me, we'll get some interesting insight from from this you know, simple um, acknowledgement I'm going to make. Um, it's you know confusing, in a sense. Um, the in fact, the, the 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 properly technical point of view that it can be the shape of a formation or or the use of a certain weapon, or mm, generally speaking, matters that stop generally to to if you want to the individual soldier in a sense because even in here when talk about formations it's 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 not that there is a much um a great interest from 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 these um askers uh, about the collective interaction of the troops within the unit but it seems that they stop to the the idea of the the most the most question thing is the testudo right thinking but there are many people out there who believed that the Tessudo was actually a tactic, right, you know, that, that uh, even an offensive one, that it was somewhat special, that was used just by the Romans, that it was um, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, something magic that was used to win battles, right, that, that what the Romans called Testudo, you know, it w was something that has been done, I, I think every single historical army that we know um, has always done, right, the, the, that in, in, in the bad conditions in which you were exposed without protection in the open to intense fire, putting shield over yourself to protect it. This is documented literally for everybody. They used it was used by the Gauls, it was used by the, the, the what you see the question here is is paying a, a preconception about the fact that um mostly it's about weapons. Right? That 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 everything in war gets down to what kind of weapon you used or how you used it. Right, that is literally one of the least important, if not virtually the single least important thing of all. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I could start, you know, ranting again about moral forces, you know, uh, but if one wants really to get it to, to tactical models that, that actually were employed and these troops at least trained for in the face of battle, that's definitely um, in, uh, in terms of collective training, that is, you know, tactics at units level that can derive to say company size is basically the most important from from a tactical point of view in terms of actual autonomy th these units had on the field right um, that um, were essentially what made most of at least the tactical work done on the same right uh, in, in terms of, of sheer mechanics then of course the, the whole thing had to do with a broader battle plan how you know with all the factors you can't possibly imagine that overwhelmed whatever tactical training or capabilities these units had, right? And this is just to put it in a, in a broader perspective of scale of importance. That is, you know, what, perhaps one of the single most important, if not the single most important, at least tactical uh, thought that I want to, to transmit to Schwerpunkt, that is to say, and, and through also the Cla von Clausewitz series, that is, look, that this is not a deterministic system. It's not that these armies won because, you know, they used one weapon or they used even one tactic instead than another. Um, or that they knew how to perform it. But the question is, they could, first of all, why? And what is that stood behind the, the thing, right? So today we talk, if you want, about something that goes a bit against the, the you know, uh, theoretically against the idea. We'll list a series of formations and, and try to to essentially explain how they worked um, and for what purpose. But the question here is realizing that most battles, as we also analyze uh, frequently on this channel, actually worked for reasons that had practically nothing to do with that. That um, the, the, also the hyper sophistication, high, you know, the high level of training, you know, troops that can bring to this great sophistication of tactics, uh, it's not. It doesn't give you the the actual opportunity or possibility to to perform them whenever you like uh, in the in the in the measure you need them uh, in the time you need them, and that at the end of the day, m battles are going to be decided by uh, let's say not more trivial but you know simpler things that um, naturally are 
connected to, to a very complex set of, of causes. Uh, so today we talk about, like, could be the Constantinian army stereotypically, but it, it, it's something can stretch up to back into the third, even the second, quote, Aryan, for example, but also the fifth, even the sixth century, right? Just to say that basically all armies out there, at least in the sanitary world, use a bit the same, all the same tactics, right? And um, we'll see maybe some of these aspects in another time, but we also have to point out that this is a moment in history where there is a, a great level of symmetry between the armies, right? Um, First of all, because we're talking about pre-industrial times, so the actual potential of these political and social entities was pretty much even for our own standards, right? Um, secondly, because uh, there was definitely a, a considerable improvement uh, in the military art of some peoples, see, uh, this, the same Romans, actually, and this is another topic we, we touch here and there, that is uh, the Constantinian army was actually by far a, a more advanced military machine than it had been the one of the early empire. This is something that many people just can't get over uh, with and, and, um, and um, you know, okay, I'm not here to convince anyone, but I make videos in which I explain this stuff, so, you know, at least if you're interested in perspective, take a chance to understand why we historically know I'm not the only person who believes this, and uh, definitely even that wouldn't make a difference. Um, sources speak in a way, and it's important to 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 to, to read them. Um, but also, we're talking about the, um, for example, the so-called Germanization of the Roman army. That is something that actually uh, I believe it's it's a, a historical. Uh, misunderstanding that is you know if there was anything that happened there was the Germans to be Romanized and the Roman army to always remain the the hyper you know the, the most efficient component of the Roman state and the the most effective mean of Romanization that existed out there so what we read as kind of a Germanization of the Roman army is actually a misunderstanding that uh, in part derives from the fact that the Romans had always used foreign troops um, in uh, in even large mm, or larger more than half of their actual armed forces in in in, in, in number, um, and that by this time all the auxilia had been fundamentally absorbed into the, the Roman state. I mean, the, better the Roman state had become fundamentally homogeneous you know, as far as military organization was was involved. There were surely foreign elements never never lacked, but not as it, much as it had been before. So much of, what, of, of the Roman troops we see today are, in the sense, the, um, the those who received the legacy of those types of units that the Romans mostly drew originally from foreign people, that the, the tactical um, functions uh, now were performed mostly by the, the Romans. And that's why many people actually interpret this time erroneously as a time of decline of the Roman military, where it was actually a time of great boosting, like, you know, the, the threats that the Romans managed to counter uh, from the Alamanni to the Sassanids in, in the 4th century are something that Rome had never met before, right? And strictly speaking, not just in terms of um, broader capacities of the empire, that in, in part, uh, this is also debatable, had contracted, you know, that it was a different political and social reality, but if we're speaking specifically of a tactical um, dimension, well, yes, what was happening in 4th century battlefields was much more devastating than what had ever happened before, um, as far as the Romans were concerned. And, um, and it, many people misinterpret the fact that now that there was a component of the Roman army that f was fundamentally kind of more elite, such as the Comitatensis, the mobile army, um, as a kind of a elitization of what the, you know, the, the broader uniformity of the heavy Roman legionary infantry had been back in the day. The question is way more shaded, shaded than this. Now, we can't talk about it because we would need to make a, a video that fundamentally introduces the, the, the fourth century, the Constantinian reforms, but it, it's something that happened in previous times in, in a very political and social, different political and social context that therefore doesn't, you know, doesn't render possible to evaluate the military, um, in the Roman military in its entirety in the same way as before. Even if it was for that, actually, the fourth century Roman army has hardly anything to do in there to envy to the previous one. 
But tactically speaking, there is no doubt that there was, for example, an increase of, of training, of uh, combined arms tactics. Many people do not understand this. Many people do not understand that, you know, being more, uh, you know, less loaded in armor, that metal armor does has nothing to do with being more military advanced than before. Many people stop to that. Remember when I said it's all about weapons and armor for many? Well, that's exactly the problem, right? If you don't understand the concept of combined arms or how and why, you know, an army can be more effective, uh, has it um, a, a greater collective training rather than a you know, specific individual one, or, or in, like in this case, a, a greater diversification right, of training, we can hardly get to the conclusions of. We will leave in this for another a specific video, because understanding why or not a, a Roman army increased its uh, attacking and defensive potential in 4th century compared to previous times is something you can't properly measure on, on the battlefield in terms of sheer you know, power delivered, uh, but also for not countering what we were saying before, also in here consider that properly the difference with previous times wasn't also dramatic, right? That there were that this was simply an adaptation to new challenges, and it was improving its absolute effectiveness. Then, once again, uh, things first of all took another path during the fifth century, where there is an objective decrease. Um, in um, you know in the military capabilities of the state first of all and that's the, the actual problem not the capacity of the army per se in terms of tactical um, models or training etc but it's also once again another context and we should treat it separately so mm, it's obvious that when we talk about battle formations the Roman deployment in the battlefield could take on different formations in function of tactical necessities. According to Vegetius 126, the records had to be trained uh, to modify their their deployment information depending on the evolution of the battle, right? And deploying in square, acias quadrata, in uh, cunus or trigonus as it was also called, or in circular formation, the orpis. Now, you understand, first of all, that here there is not a sp specific information about which size, a unit size, this change took place, nor specifically why it should have taken place. You see, uh, the Jetsus, by his own admission, didn't understand much about military affairs, um, and, uh, you know, reading this source naturally should be done with, with specific accuracy. Um, there is one aspect of military logic that stands in the simplicity of uh, of military operations. That is to say, these battles uh, were fought at the time. They're still, you know, pretty big events, uh, m many occasions. Of course, um, yes, the, there is a kind of a decrease of big clashes like it had happened in the Hellenistic era um, and the you know the, the Roman conquest because certain polities had contracted were less resources this is another another issue but generally speaking yes we're talking about the same scale of engagement and the, the point is that the, the more complex an army is the larger it is the, the more articulated it is and let's say the more uh, what you actually need is a simple plan first of all because if you are actually strong, you need to deliver, deliver that force all in all in one blow, uh, or even if you know it's a multiple lines. This this yeah, this lines had more or less to stay the same and deliver just frontally a thing using a gradual release of forces and so on, but not to overcomplicate the picture. This is not a video game. When you have a unit, you can send it here and there from every side of the battlefield and, and reform every time you want to make it perform any kind of charges you want. No, armies in real in reality are something extremely delicate to maneuver that it's already a great deal to, to, to make stand, you know, all together on a battlefield and that are, you know, require actually very, um, you know, careful moves and especially and hopefully pre-planned, where there is enough space, enough enough energy to, to perform the same thing, and still with a military logic that assumes a, you know, kind of pattern, you know, essentially speaking, in terms of how 
um, far and how much and you know how extended that that the, the unit can be, where it can reach, right? Things like that. So, to make the long story short, uh, the idea of, of switching a formation uh, on the field is something that becomes easier. Uh, the smaller the unit is, and consequently, the, the the less important it properly becomes, right? So it's obvious that I don't know a, a you know a platoon type, uh, you know a platoon sized unit is, is much more flexible than a kind of division type unit, right? Um, and there, there are of course also larger units that can maybe pass from you know a, an Aches, uh quadrata to uh, you know, maybe to an orbis, right? It, it depends. Uh, but the question is, most of the times, what these men must be trained to do is not much to change formation during the battle, but if anything, you know, deploying. What is, what is uh, before it, uh, what is crucial mostly in all these maneuvers and really makes the difference in battle a lot is how long it takes for you to arrive on the field and to orderly and safely, you know, and say with with a cer uh, certain spare energies, you are able to pass from from column to battle line, um, and it, it, to meet the enemy. Uh, so passing from a square to uh, a wedge or uh, to a circle, uh, you know, it's something that on a battle, you know, if you do the circus as these. In the Roman army actually did in Palestine. Yeah, it's something cool, um, and uh, you know, surely they were trained to do such things. But the the meaning that it has is, is not much in itself tactical. But if anything, you know, just maybe a way to stay in shape to maintain a certain level of cohesion of precision, so that you actually, you know, training for example troops to perform, like it, the justice says in in here, they were trained before. Um, more complex maneuvers, right, in in, in, in the drill, um, actually something that makes it easier to pass to, to those basic uh, formations that, that you would normally use in battle without too many complications. Why? Not because these three specific examples weren't actually used. I mean, the HS Quadrata is, is the normal rectangular or squared formation that you find in units on a regular base. The coolness, as we'll speak here um, more carefully about to, to really uh, see what, what it was, and here we're talking, by the way, we're talking about cavalry and infantry alike, mm -hmm. and which makes a difference, of course, that we'll try to make later, um, was also something, if not pre-planned, yeah, you, you could technically pass to a square to, to a Kunis during the battlefield, but what does, for example, a Kunis mean, and also in, in what the size of this unit? What, what's the level of cohesion? What's what's also the level of cohesion of the enemy? What's what's the point in the battle, right? Um, circular formation was normally for you know when you were surrounded, sometimes even for retreating, as we will see, and it's not very different actually from from the square Napoleonic times, right? Where at Vienna you find you know Saxon grenadiers who literally retreated from the field in a square, also with counter bit the myth that a square was uh, static. Um, square was at the time and not a circle, I presume for reasons that have to do with you know um, fire angles uh, in firearms uh, in the firearm era. But um, the um, the the orb is, is pretty much the, the same thing conceptually speaking in the ancient world, and it is to be seen in fact used in 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 the same way. We've seen it also in the Middle Ages. Uh, I think I don't know the Scots at Bannockburn or you know there there are. Uh, easy example to, to understand. Also, consider that when we talk about this geometrical forms, we were talking specifically squares, rectangles, uh, apparently triangles, but not obviously now specifically the thing, or circles. We don't have to literally believe that these were actually it, right? That they, they actually were, that the troops were literally deployed in a perfectly geometrical formation. Um, the the terms here, the terminology is much more flexible, um, and it mostly means like if we were to make it uh, to rationalize the, uh, the 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 semantics of this, that they they kind of assume a form that, that took the, the sh more or less the the resemblance of that, right? In fact, and uh, this is being found. I found it, for example, in medieval sources that the orbis very often meant 
simply, you know, in, in a, actually without any formation, that is to say, like a handful of people throwing uh, themselves out and attacking like that. The coolness, as we'll see now, so doesn't have much to do with a wedge or triangle, but it was just, you know, because with the idea of a close, um, you know, close order and maybe some some relations in the geometrical forms of it. The ashes quadrata here really means the square the square angle of, of the corners of the formation. How as, as you line up normally the troops um, for to to form a, a line of battle that has to follow this yeah going straight perpendicularly at the at the enemy against the enemy line. It, it, that's where what's ge the geometry of it, and that's where it assumes that shape. But we're not talking in absolute terms of guys that were training for forming shapes of any kind for for a reason that you can't think to be tactic tactically sens sensible right also consider that um it takes time to change formation and not only but you can't do it as you you see sometimes in some you know videos when people that uh you know, I can't say reenactment, but, you know, uh, aside from the fact that they use ridiculous numbers of people, but, you know, people, I don't know, ch switching formation, like turning 180 degree and thinking that that's how armies could cope, I don't know, with an enemy that was coming from the rear. Uh, every person who has read since Xenophon, you know, military history knows that, that there is a very specific, right, and unchangeable, practically, order uh, of the troops for which, you know, in the way units are formed, deployed to fight on the field, that is... You, as an individual, are trained to, to follow the guy who's in front of you. It's not just a guy like any other. It's that specific guy. You probably also share your, your tent with. You have a confidence you've already been in combat with that has a specific size that is in front of you because it's usually, you know, maybe more experience that you're uh, used to guide to follow. So if if the formation changes you know, in a different way, you, you literally get lost. That, that cohesion, that internal psychophysical cohesion of the unit is lost, right? So passing to... These other kinds of formations is, uh, you know, technically there are ways to do it, still tendentially preserving that unit and cohesion, but it's uh, much of it naturally gets lost. And especially much of these formations actually are assumed in kind of conditions of emergency. Like especially the Orbis literally means that you maybe uh, sometimes you're, you're literally surrounded. You have to protect every single flank to form a, to provide a, a front of every side, and, and that's basically the thing. But that's not the, uh, you know, an optimal tactical situation. You're pretty much, you know, most of the times, if not done for, but, you know, being surrounded is definitely no no great uh, situation, right? So this is important to bear in mind. And there are other interesting deployments for, deployment forms. We have the disposition at Falks or uh, actually um, uh, Crescent, Right, had to be um, particularly appreciated um, at some point. Um, for example, by Julian, we know that he's witnessed during a battle of his against the Alamanni in 356, when it, it said uh, by uh, Mianus 16:12-13, in bicornem figuram, which literally means in the two-horned uh, figure image uh, face. Right, uh, so. What does this mean? It's believed to be literally a crescent, right? Um, uh, we'll see here. Um, also, there's another situation in um, in occasion of a Persian attack with Julian's army marching 363, where the emperor disposed the units according to uh, a crescent form with the curved extremities. Uh, literally from uh, Amianus uh, 25.116, Lunari Ace uh, Sinuatisque Lateribus. Right, which means um, literally the lunar uh, array, battle array, sinuatis quelateribus, meaning with curved sides, right? With the idea that this was, you know, this battle line was bent uh, like an arc, like the crescent form, um, which is uh, the the same. Um, uh, double horn thing we were saying for more or less it's also interesting the same source actually uses two ways to define this thing could be different in a sense because the first actually places the um, the um, the emphasis on the fact that there were two horns which technically could mean um, that there were maybe two strong sides right not necessarily a crescent form um, or um, so 
this is important because the the Carnus also um, was um, was intended sometimes properly as a unit on its own, right? So we, we here we don't necessarily mean that um, there was a continuous figure with two whole, you know two stronger um, extremities towards the front and the rest arced. We don't properly know. Um, we also very often do not know exactly how these armies were composed. Right, we we actually studied the Battle of Strasbourg last year, and we we have seen by which uh, that's actually a deployment for the Roman army and also for the German, the Alemannic one, that that is fairly fairly understandable at some level, it's, but normally it's not like this, especially towards uh, can't even say towards the late Roman Empire because we don't even know much about the early Empire for that matter, uh, while the Lunariace Sinuatis Quelatribus is much more eloquent. It literally says that this is a crescent in Latin, so it's um, it's clear um, at that point. So why a deployment like this? Well, uh, of course, uh, as far as the two horns, if we want to extremize the thing as literally nothing to do with a crescent, but just to you know to main punches, one left, one right. Uh, well, that can correspond to any tactical need that requires that that, that specific attack on both sides and having maybe a weaker center. Because there might have been other units l linking up with two, right? Um, this also happens, you know, for I, I presume in conditions when uh, the enemy is potentially, you know, uh, is going to outflank you um, in some way, or simply because you you wanna um, you wanna neutralize in a way maybe the the impact of an enemy center, which in case of the Al the, the Alamanni was mostly how these guys tended to uh, to charge straight. Um, we'll see a bit about the Cunius later, um, what, what to really mean more precisely. Relatively to the Crescent, th this is interesting because from a military historical point of view, it's not an extremely frequent uh, deployment. Uh, it, um, I've studied these things even for medieval battles, and um, it, it's actually a fascinating topic, but naturally the, the meaning of having uh, um, a concave uh, the deployment is that you want the enemy essentially to enter in and to be exposed um, on the flanks, uh, especially by 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 missile fire. Right, the idea that these mm, crescent could close towards the extremities and bottle up the the enemy is, uh, yeah. I mean, there, there are definitely instances in which this this could happen, but it's never actually to, to close fully the enemy, uh, but just to, to keep him attacking and wearing him out what was fighting in the front on the sides as well, right? And speaking of late Roman times, it just sounds more like, you know, you want to bottle him up to to, to our ass and put the dramatic increasing, uh, the, the dramatically increased missile potential of the, of, of the Roman legions at this point that had literally everything you can imagine they could throw uh, at the enemy. The mm, coolness Formation uh, is to be found uh, also, you know, with a good frequency. For example, in uh, Maxentius' army in 312 in the, uh, the Battle of Turin against Constantine's forces, this is from the Panegyrici Latini 963, um, with the heavy cavalry placed in the front, right? This is fascinating because. The the conus is naturally conceived as a, as a punching formation, whichever where, you know whichever shape it actually had. Right, the idea that there is somebody who is on the lead and that has to crash through is is important. More of that later. Um, the conus is witnessed also in uh, Amianus seventeen thirteen nine. Uh, in um, in okay, on occasion of the massacre carried out in 358 by the troops of Constantius the the second um, at the damage of the um, Limigantes Sarmatians that having rebelled had threatened the emperor um, and so the Roman soldiers quote formed a coolness that in the simplicity of the military language is said uh, pig snout caput porch pig's head and they the Romans dispersed the enemy with an energic attack right Aconis is also formed when Julian 
during the uh, Perizaborra siege in, in Persia uh, had to um, shift on the battlefield right he, the this is an interesting information the the soldier the, the infantrymen that actually accompany him were disposed cuneatim literally um, and they um, also locked the shields to protect the emperor from the Persian arrows this is from always from Amiens 24 12 14 right so these um, informations are actually precious because they mm, introduce pretty pretty well what w w the, the concept of the Kunis right so the Kunis is often believed to be kind of a wedge or triangle formation the idea that this thing has uh, has to have an angle in the front so that it has to enter something right uh, that is hopefully the, the enemy the enemy line the battle line to, to, to split it in two so this has given just even for the the concept of the Kunis as an angle right um, as a wedge, the, uh, the the geometrical based um, idea that this could be like literally a, a perfectly triangular um, um, spearhead formation, for which there was literally one guy or like two, a few guys in the very top, right? What should be the first rank, um, and to literally make him crash individually against the demanding battle line. And that the rest would just follow them and press them from 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 the rear. Now, there is actual information of this mechanics that is pretty obvious that exists in infantry, but not in cavalry, right? Because cavalry doesn't push like um, infantry can. You can press like in phalanx, literally pressing with a limit naturally of, of muscular force that is also dispersed from a rank to another. The guys in the first lines, you know, we know from a political tactics that you know that there were you know certain corpses of men had been killed in the first line that remained standing because they were so pressed between the two uh, lines uh, fighting that they didn't have literally the, the physical f space to, to fall on the ground um, th this is kind of a bit of a different I mean not, not an accessible different thing at some levels but uh, the idea that this became um, uh, fundamentally a matter of one guy at the top to launch this assault is so-so. Uh, but mm, I would like to present you the two points of view because one is just that, right, and you can actually rule it out uh, as the Brook already did, for example, in his own time. The Brook said a lot of, you know, you know, incorrect things. Uh, you know, we're all thankful for his role in historiography and what he, he did and what he wrote. We, we start from, from it at a level. But um, he was right at least in saying that uh, this would have been suicidal because first of all um, you you know first of all that guy in the front would be exposed to any kind of missile fire possible uh, during the attack he would find himself as soon as he enters the enemy lines you know basically having to fight with the guy in the front and some others in, in, in on the side um, also the, the the push at that point from the posterior ranks couldn't couldn't arrive uh, straight at him and it would crush in, in between the soldiers in his um, rear because the, the wedge would you know channel the vectors not through the front as you would like like in a battle line is created in fact exactly that but you know just crashing through an, an axis within the same unit and just partially over the, the poor guy would be you know completely squeezed and, and destroyed but by, by this force ideally right um, so this is actually to rule out there is also However, a distinction that can help us mm, focus better on the difference here um, that we can draw from also from the ancient sources in this context of um, Akunis meant as a wedge, and I mean specifically rhomboid formation, as it was used I meaning here from from centuries and centuries. Right, think about the Thessalians and and now, especially for cavalry, speak for that, and then properly something it could become more similar to a spearhead, more to the function of literally punching with, with a point, but that is, however, something more compact and less geometrical than than what we were sketching uh, just right now. Um, the wedge, if we can, yeah, differentiate between the, the pig snout and the, the wedge, you know, the wedge would be something that you, you would use chiefly um, to 
uh, and, and this was used by by Alexander a lot, for example, with this cavitus descent cavalry. The idea that if you have a rhomboid formation, you have a guy in the top, uh, in the front, that is uh, a front angle that is exposed to the enemy, and who leads the other guys. And this this is important because the guys are focused on him, um, and there's just one guy you have to follow, and that could reduce, in a sense, the the complications of even seeing, you know, keeping up with the rest of the line uh, information. Yes, it can cause more, um, you know, um, more crowding and less order in turn, but at least you have that guy in the front, you know, you have to follow him, and that's it. But the advantages, especially when the formation is actually very orderly, is that this wedge, uh, and this, is, this was good especially for cavalry, and especially not for charging, but for uh, at least not with this with spearhead with with if the, the forward angle, but rather, you know, change in front eventually to do it to in fact change front. I mean, if you have this, um, this this arrangement, you, I don't know, you you go you advance. Let's assume, in, uh, towards the, uh, following your your leader at the top of the angle. But what you can do, right? Either because you're under threat, or because you are the ones who want, want who wants to uh, deceive the enemy about your your where, which direction you want to attack, you can more easily, more easily, just by turning by 90 degree or less sometimes, to either shift the wall formation, uh, um, to turn the wall formation right or left, with a much greater um, ease than actually turning an entire square formation of 90 degrees, right, which entails actually a big deal of effort, especially for the guys who are um, from the uh, the wheeling end, right, that actually have to run at some point, while the, the guys that, that remain fixed uh, on the hinge are basically remain standing on their feet, I mean, maybe just literally turning um, as, uh, as individuals. Um, this was very uh, effective, especially for, say, light or especially medium cavalry, a cavalry that could f skirmish by following just this leader in the front um, and in that sense as a wedge concentrating, this is the point, the, the missile fire on towards the front where in theory the wall formation could still charge so creating, um, and this is valid also for infantry though, you know, to to actually facilitate the this punch towards the enemy formation by First of all, softening up the, the enemy lines, and you know if you have this corner in front of the enemy, uh, the enemy can yes definitely target, as we've seen before heavily the, the guy in the first line. But at the same time, you the, these flanks yes they get all uh, the more uh, you go in depth uh, in, in the posterior ranks, the, the more they distance themselves from the enemy themselves, and especially the, the more they approach them, and the thinner the line becomes. Therefore, the least the people can target the enemy. But at the same time, they also escape the enemy fire. So the concept is that um, at least by continuing to advance, all these guys can, uh, as it was done, think about how the pillow were normally thrown offensively. This is not the time; it were other, uh, and actually even worse altogether, considering the, the various combined arms m m tactics and missile attacks in this regard. Target gradually in in um, the the enemy front. Uh, um, towards the sides, therefore opening a gap before charging in that, and uh, therefore objectively causing an important damage to a section of the enemy battle line. Alternatively, as we were saying before, especially if these guys were cavalry, they could turn wheel much more quickly um, and uh, maybe attack an enemy that uh, other cavalry that surprised them either on the fl uh, on the right or on the left um, that weren't deploying the same way and that therefore maybe had some you know disadvantage at you know uh, handling the situation not knowing where this wedge would turn um, its front towards where it had it to to charge right and that that is especially in orientatively something that skirmish cavalry did it was a lot of uh, about this in late Roman armies and also in other armies, consider at this time cavalry is um, j is still you know it's, it's still inferior to infantry, right? There is definitely an increase in importance of cavalry, but 
it's um, it's somewhat maybe uh, been exaggerated historically. I mean, at least in still in the imaginary, the idea that you know cavalry increased so much, yes, but it didn't accomplish more than much. Right, that's something that began to happen, but more in the heart of the Middle Ages for reasons that have a few to do um, with uh, the political and social reality, both of the Roman Empire and of the. Uh, the peoples that they they fought against, uh, except someone. I mean, maybe you know, yeah, the Sasanians had had probably a feudal society already, so that is an ex- a notable exception. Notable exception, but think about just the Romans that tried to copy the cataphracts and they failed miserably in the late Roman Empire because they every time they used it, it sucked. You know, we're talking about the Battle of Strasbourg is a pretty good example how just light um, and heavy Germanic cavalry could could take over the Roman cataphracts, but this is also another another issue. However, we shouldn't rule out completely, and um, we can't because we know it also happens. Um, the The idea of properly smashing force that could have roughly, approximately, kind of a conus formation. Um, what we're talking about, well, did this often happen kind of in heroic warfare? I mean, literally in those societies that were not very different, in fact, from the I don't know, the Germanic tribes or the Romans were fighting today. I mean, of course, they absolutely Germanic warfare this time was nothing like heroic warfare, right? You know, that was something very primitive that those Germans had abandoned to so an important amount of time. But however, that maintained a certain reminiscence of it that basically stood in, constituted the idea that it was a battle line where theoretically all the freemen participated, so at the same, uh, with some internal segmentation, sure, but tendentially in a in a in an equal thickly compacted formation and then the the leader the clan leader that had to show this this wall tribe that um he he had the guts to 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 stand his ground and to to be fully committed to the cause and so on would was positioned dismounted often at strasbourg literally the the, the Alemannic cavalry wanted that was the nobility wanted to fight on, on cavalry and that was unanimously thought, uh, like in, in the ancient world, to say if you fought on horseback, you were a coward because you could escape the battlefield. So you had to dismount and, and f- fight within the phalanx with the others, right? And normally the chieftain would take this central position in the front line, right? And usually in this regard, um, you know, he was surrounded by, you can think, his bodyguards, so, you know, this grizzled, uh, at this point, basically professional veterans of the comitatus, I mean, a semi-professional, it's you not know, used to big words, um, that would make, even just for training, for experience, for especially collective training, as we were saying before, and also equipment, uh, the hard bulk of the army. So, in practice, if in this battle line was otherwise composed normally by guys that sometimes didn't even have an armor proper, um, th- th- somebody had to, to charge into the enemy line, so to break them, and the Germans were mostly about infantry, and that's ha- what they had implemented dramatically, also you know, introducing weapons that had, such as the Angundi, uh, that had the same degree of penetrability of the Roman pilum, um, and uh, had probably have javelins, in this regard, well, that was that center. So you could expect, in practice, that uh, bodyguard to launch himself. Yes, um, you know, in front of all the others. So technically, yeah, in a kind of a coolness, right? But more, per, you know, more likely, this meant that not that they were in a triangular shape. They were just a, a column, like all the others. That um, it wasn't even maybe just a column, it could be simply a section of the wall phalanx, and maybe wasn't even deployed in the front proper, but was just, you know, in depth, one of the, the various divisions of the army. The would charge straight, and it, this is interesting because um, here we're talking about a highly hierarchized uh, tribe, but you have to imagine, naturally, these were all different clans together, so each clan probably worked in the same way, so that there were so many smaller punches all over the line that corresponded to, to those clan leaders and their uh, ferocious competition, by the way, uh, within the same tribe that had, you know, generally a low cohesion, at least, the, the Alemanni, at least, where we are mentioning now, they had actually pretty good one. Uh, and that's why they were also so so uh, so effective from a military point of view, uh, because of political cohesion, as always, in close of its in terms. But um, they would be the ones who would, yeah, charge, like, straight, but still in a 
still in a in a in a square formation right so yes if you pick the wall army yes it's, it looks like the, there is an advanced um, head that charges through the enemy but those would actually charge uh, protecting the clan leader on on the flanks and the sides and not necessarily in a rare uh, position not in with this wedge and so they would punch the enemy and this a section of the enemy uh, line all, all together, right? And that's the damage that you actually want to achieve, right? The, there is this myth that is often used also by people who have not like, a very clear idea <laughs> what 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 what, uh, what tactics are that presume to say that I don't know the Romans charged defeated the Macedonians because they charged into the you know the not the gaps that could form in a broken phalanx, but literally in the, in the gaps that exist in every single battle line because of the, the unit's divisions, right? Just because they had the, the swords, right? They could uh, they could shift the pikes away and, and fight. Ah, oh, yes, you know, because like any other people that have uh, fought against Macedonian was an idiot and not thought about that, especially didn't use swords of sword, right? It wasn't like that. Um, entering to creating a, a small wedge into a battle line is it's it's not good right you, you 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 it's it's dangerous on the contrary for you because you expose yourself you expose yourself there's no tactical advantage whatsoever deriving from it what you want is to make an entire section of of the enemy line collapse so that the, the, the at the end of the day that, that why why were armies always deployed like in, in in lines with a certain thickness because that's exactly what you want to do is to present this compact wall that wears out the other compact wall in front along the wall perimeter, or at least a, a broad enough section of the same to make the, the wall freaking thing collapse, right? And most of the collapses here we know from the battles uh, happen either from, from the flanks, who were naturally at some point more vulnerable, especially when they they lost the, the cavalry protection. If you remember the Battle of Strasbourg, that's exactly where actually there were those auxilia in, in, in Julian's army that, managed to resist and to crush Alemannic cavalry on the right flank even though the, the, the cataphracts had been knocked out um, and there and they managed to and th this may also explain actually the uh, the double horns that were reading up before which are remembered for the same campaign of the Battle of Strasbourg by the way that in, could, in that sense could were a way to reinforce still the the infantry line Considering the danger that cavalry posed on the flanks, uh, which didn't mean maybe to to thin the center, but to, I mean, yes, you know, we're in other relative terms too, but mostly to reinforce the flanks proper. Yeah, that's why also multiple lines were used because naturally it was a reserve to to wear out the enemy. Uh, we studied that in the Funkrieg. Pretty, we know how it works, right? Pretty well. That, you know, resources spent, even you know, even in condition of of su numerical superiority can make the difference for uh, they can't make you lose at the end of the day um, so and, and especially the Alemann in that point counted all in the initial charge so if either they, uh, it's either they broke in the first charge of course there were multiple ones and even in here it's not that there was a completely uniform order and that's what we have to get you know to, to get um, to understand pretty clearly here that this geometricity of principles in the practice of warfare there wouldn't actually happen uh, if not as we were saying in the beginning the larger the units were so that it's kind of a more elementary simpler how you have deployed them on a, on a larger surface but not because individually you know these guys eventually maintain the, the necessary um, not much the cohesion but with the cohesion of the broader wall right intact and that's what the enemy is actually exactly aiming at at damaging at, at disrupting um, so the um, also the caput porci precisely with the conus is um, is not to be meant as a, in the, in that regard as a as properly the geometrical shape of the unit of the unit formation while charging, but rather considering the, a specific unit of the army to be sent forward with that function that is more understandable. Uh, this um, fits also for cavalry, right? We, as we were saying before, at the Battle of Turin in 312, um, Maxentius army deploys in Cunis with um, heavy cavalry post at, at the head of it. 
So cavalry is also less in number. So it, yeah, it might have even looked in as as a, in shape as a triangle. But at the end of the day, what the point here was is still that probably cavalry had its own well extended front, and that it was used as a as a spearhead to crush the enemy in the enemy front. Um, and the rest would have just to to follow. But this might have been just as if the cavalry was was one of the lines, right? It conceived. Right, and and this and more even more eloquent about the uh, and supporting the idea that the Kunis is actually the cl a close uh, a close order rather than uh, than an actual formation is the uh, Pirisabor example when Julian is uh, accompanied by uh, his infantry. Um, over the battlefield, which is something that uh, he did even at Strasbourg, going back and forth. So you were, we're not talking about lots of men, but enough to to guard the uh, the emperor and to you know to to make him essentially raise morale, going here and there, where in, in the sections of the line that, that were uh, uh, taking the the hardest uh, attacks from the enemy. And here the infantry is to set to have been deployed in cuneatim. So they were literally in, in a thickly packed formation, like a, probably bodyguards, right? So much that they locked the shields to protect the emperor from the Persian arrows. That's the concept. What's a kunis? That, that's probably a wedge in the sense of a more of a, of some of, of a unit that goes out there on its own, right? And it, spearheading that can that not necessarily uh, has to do with the the actual mm, employment as a punch against the enemy it simply here it gives me the idea of, of something that goes straight towards a direction on its own right something that has its own head that is directed somewhere that's the idea and here especially also it's the thickness of the of the R rate that makes the the, the difference then there is another type of formation that is essentially specular to the caput porci, which is the uh, the 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 schisser, in a sense, the forceps, um, that uh, is referred to by Amian in um, Amian sixteen eleven three. That, however, m mentions it referring to the combined maneuver of two separated armies during the uh, Alamannic campaign of 357, right? Um, so here, as you understand, w what would be the, the ratio of, not of a, of a spearhead, but like a, a B, right? Like uh, properly an army deployed with, with this angle of death on the flanks and, you know, the, with the angle open towards the enemy. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, a unit closing at, at the bottom end, uh, in depth. Well, this sounds at least similar to the Acius Lunaris, right? The idea that uh, you, you, in fact, catch the enemy into the... You oblige the enemy to charge into one of the... Uh, I mean, in, in the center. Here, uh, there are, however, two armies actually use... Um, attacking in the same way uh, at the same time so there are two distinct things first of all so it's not uh, a formation that would be normally used by the army and secondly yes it would be a contingency in which I don't know it's pretty obvious you know if they, let's assume there is a battle line uh, Romans fighting against the Alemanni and then there is I don't know Roman reinforcements arriving uh, not from a square angle but say diagonally against the Let's say the the rare left, so rare uh, side for of the of the uh, of the Alemannic line. Well, yes, they will attack, and at some point they will meet themselves uh, at the extremities if they're extended enough with the rest of the Roman army. So you, they will close the enemy into this kind of V uh, scissor thing. But the the question is, it's just random, right? And consider that while the uh, the crescent formation is at least with the maybe with the two horns at the extremities to reinforce to avoid um, you know the 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 sides being overrun etc. In fact, the the V shape is more vulnerable to flank attacks because 
um, the the shapes are um, are th uh, the the har arms. Let's say the, the two sides are are weaker, right? They are not uh, why because they they do not present their front perpendicularly to the enemy, but they are, it's as if they were in part given their flank even more than um, and then exposed the, as it, it would be exposed in the crescent formation. Uh, because you're essentially thinning the line, you're you're extend, you're protruding these two wings towards the enemy, far away from the the let's say the, what is presumably the center of your formation. Because in all of this, uh, consider that uh, yeah, it's kind of very dangerous to have an enemy that is deployed in the front and you you deploy your troops not perpendicular to that, exposing literally part of the flank to them. Um, that's not good, that's not much functional, especially if the enemy doesn't bottle up himself inside, right? Which could still do. Um, but th this, as we were saying before, it's also a formation that can uh, be created in, in, uh, in different uh, situations, in a sense. I mean, if you, for example, mani manage to encircle the enemy in a way, yes, you will tendentially form that, but at that point it's been mostly the enemy that has made himself bottled up. Um, by maybe a, a pincer movement and and not necessarily, um, uh, you know, the, which is something that might have actually pr like think about can knife right? What what it was actually performed because of a specific maneuver during the battlefield, not because they would initially like to end up in them. So as you understand, these are even just uh, a bit too theoretical. Uh, considerations because the practice would be normally quite more standard than it sounds, right? It's not that there are many alternatives on how to fight on a battlefield, <laughs> right? Um, unless the terrain is in a particular form, but that, at that point it, it becomes more like, uh, especially more static because at that point you would exploit it mostly in kind of a defensive fashion and it could take even more complicated shapes, uh, at least maybe not so orderly in a geometric pattern, but you know, still in a way that plays with angles and stuff in a in a more uh, let's say evident way. There is also another information from Amiens twenty nine five forty one um during the period of Fermus revolt in Africa three hundred seventy two three hundred seventy five when the general Theodosius Magister Militum Pergallias repelled an enemy attack opposing his troops in a circular deployment. Literally Aches Rotundo Abit. Right, and we were essentially explaining before what this formation uh, would be here. It's in a defensive uh, function, as you understand. So, yeah, you're surrounded, not probably in a great situation, um, or uh, you know, the the circle sometimes is might have been just uh, just half circle, right? Just maybe you were not surrounded, but you wanted to be sure that the enemy wouldn't. Um, overrun your side so you you would deploy in a, in this um convex fashion for with you you have a, a half circle towards the enemy front and that is hopefully gonna uh, be enough to repel most of his troops especially if they are um this intrinsically exposes a bit the same uh it's a bit because the the circle inherently uh, becomes uh, takes more 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 perimeter simply to to deploy the troops it means you're thinning the line, and and that um, obviously means that you're more vul vulnerable to breakthrough. Um, but at the same time, especially when the enemy are lighter uh, and uh, you you really don't want them to infiltrate into your line. Well, yes, that's a good way to you know to deploy, and it, that's how it's being used in in multiple situations. A bit as we're saying, the concept of the square is the same thing. You are announced to have this um, this line, uh, this perimeter that can uh, deliver all the force perpendicular towards the enemy. But at the same time, you don't need that because either you're surrounded or you want to avoid that to happen. Therefore, you 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 create this thing that can defend from every side in a satisfactory fashion, and also that gives, um, in a sense, um, a greater condition of security properly to the troops on the flanks because they, they see that the thing encloses uh, around them so they 
uh, also gives them really nowhere to run. So this this is good for so for last dance or uh, how it's witnessed in earlier Roman times. Also, an actual retreat operated in globe, right uh, formation, which is um, yeah, it, it was done definitely, and it, it does make sense uh, in that regard. So. I hope that more or less we have explained what this thing, especially one of the cool news that is the, the one that raises perhaps more misunderstandings in this regard, um, could 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 practically be about, um, and we will naturally speak of uh, these issues in in another in other contexts, uh, other for other you know for other topics, but still at the end of the day, revolving around the same thing. Um, and for now, I will stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.